you're probably juggling a lot of projects, tasks, documents, and more. Smartsheet can help. Smartsheet is a powerful tool for keeping all your related project files and data in one location. You and your team can manage data in multiple views, track changes, and keep on top of the multitude of tasks that projects require. You can even create online forms that your clients or partners can fill out. Data from your forms automatically appears in your sheets, and you'll receive notifications so you can act on the incoming information quickly. Hi, I'm Senior LinkedIn Learning Staff Instructor Garrick Chow, and I'm looking forward to helping you get up and running with Smartsheet. Let's jump in. Before we jump into working with Sheets, let's take a quick look at the Smartsheet interface. The main navigation area here is on the left side of the screen, and you can see I currently have Home selected. Home is where you can quickly access the files that are the most relevant to you, like Sheets, Reports, or other items you've recently worked with here on the right under Suggested for You. You may not see anything here yet if you're just starting out with Smartsheet, but once you start working on Sheets, they'll begin appearing here. You'll also find any requests others have sent you here on the left, for example, if anyone in your team has requested you to review certain documents or data. You'll also be able to keep track of requests you've sent to others from here. And this is also one of the places you can create a new sheet with this button here on the right. Below home, you'll find notifications, where, as you probably guessed, you'll find all of your notifications listed so you can quickly read through them and respond to them. Below that is the Browse folder where you can find, manage, and open all the items you're working on. Smartsheet is entirely cloud-based, so all of your documents are just a couple of clicks away from here. Next is Recents, which gives you quick access to the files you've most recently worked on in chronological order. Then we have Favorites. Any items you've marked as a favorite will show up here so you can quickly get to it, no matter how recently or how long it's been since you've worked on it. The next button is to launch work apps. We're not going to get into work apps in this course, but basically, they're a tool for building web and mobile-based apps directly from your sheets and other items. The plus button takes you to the Solution Center, which is where you can create new sheets for a wide variety of projects. It's divided into two main categories. There's Create, which gives you access to several templates for different sheet types. And you can also select from the categories here on the left to find even more specific types of templates for a wide range of projects. If you switch to Import, you can import existing files from these four file types. And we'll be looking more closely at the Import area later as well. Here in the lower left, we have the Launcher, which gives you another way to open up the Solution Center and Work Apps. Again, we're not covering Work Apps here, but if you want to read more about Work Apps or anything else Smartsheet related, you can click the Help button, and here select Help and Learning which opens up a new browser tab and takes you to Smartsheet's Online Help and Learning Center. And the last button here is for accessing settings related to your Smartsheet account. All right, so that's a quick overview of navigating around Smartsheet. You'll find that it's pretty easy and intuitive once you've started working with your own sheets and other items. If you have a Smartsheet account already, chances are it was assigned to you by your company's IT administrator, and your account is associated with your work email address. And you can use that account to work along with me in this course. If you don't yet have a Smartsheet account and you want to follow along with me in this course, I suggest you first go to smartsheet.com and click the Try Smartsheet for Free button here at the top and create a free 30-day account. Now, this does specify that you need to use a work email address, so if you're working along with me, you'll have to register with your work email. But we're only going to create a handful of sheets throughout this course, and they're easy enough to delete when you're done, so you don't have to worry about cluttering up your account with example files. But again, if you want to work along with me, take a moment now to set up a free account before jumping into the course. When you're tracking your work with Smartsheet, there are naturally going to be times when you need to converse with your teammates about the details for the project or its individual tasks. Instead of having to switch to another app or deal with a bunch of individual email threads, you can have these conversations in Smartsheet itself. This allows you to keep all the conversations in one place on the sheet itself where everyone can see them, contribute to the conversation, and refer back to them. Like attachments, you can apply comments to single rows or to the entire sheet. To add a comment to a row, just click the comment button on that row. And that opens up the conversation panel, and here you can type in your comment. This can be anything from a general comment or a question to a comment directed specifically at one of your teammates. If you want to direct your comment to a teammate, start by typing the at symbol, 
followed by the teammate's email address. Now, right now, I only have my own email address show up because I haven't imported any other contacts, but you'll see your teammates' names show up here when you start typing them. I'll just select my own name for this example. When you're done, you can click the Send button or just press Return, and that comment has been added. And we can see here there's a comment now because this icon now shows up in this row. So anyone working on this sheet will be able to see it. If you directed your message at a specific person with the at symbol, they'll receive an email notifying them about your message and they'll know to reply. If you want to add a comment to the entire sheet instead of a single row, click Sheet here at the top. So anything you type here will start a conversation on the sheet as a whole. And there it is. Now previously we saw how to add attachments to rows or to the sheet itself. You can also add attachments to comments. Just click the attachment button here down at the bottom or click the three dot button here next to any existing comment. Choose edit comment and you can access the attachment button from here. And clicking that opens the same menu that we saw earlier when we were looking at attachments. I'll just cancel that for now. Now another useful command you'll find in this menu is the print comment command. This allows you to print out the entire conversation thread if you want to have a copy to refer back to. And from here, you can also email comment threads, or if you no longer need to keep the messages in the conversation, you can delete them. And you can also see all the comments in the sheet, whether they're attached to rows or to the entire sheet by clicking all. So that's working with comments here in Smartsheet. As we touched on earlier, Smartsheet lets you add attachments like images or other related files directly to your sheets. This gives you the advantage of having all of your work in one place. Files can be attached to a row. So for example, if you have a supporting document for one of your tasks, you can attach that document to that task. Or attachments can also be added to the entire sheet, which is useful if the attachment relates to the entire project as a whole. So for example, maybe for this demo task, I want my team to make sure we get the proper NDA signed. So I'll attach that document to this row. To do so, you can either click the attachment button here when you roll over the row, or you can click the menu button and choose attachments. Either option opens up the attachment panel here to the right, and then I can either drag in the file I want to attach from my computer into this panel, or I can click the attach files to, in this case, row four button. And that gives me a menu where I can not only upload a file from my computer, but where I can also access these popular cloud-based services where my files might be stored, like Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, and so on. If the file you want to link to is a web page, you can select the URL option here at the top. In this case though, I'm gonna click upload a file and I'll browse to my exercise files folder and select this 0401 NDA file, which is a PDF. But again, you can attach any sort of file like an image, a PowerPoint presentation, a Word document, and so on. I'll click open. And now the file is attached to the row. And we can see this attachment icon here in row four, indicating that there's an attachment. So anytime I select this row, I'll be able to see what the attachment is in the attachment panel. And I can open this PDF file here just by clicking it. And that opens the document in a new tab. Just close that for now. Now, if I click the box next to the attachment, I can come up here to the actions menu and find other options for this attachment. For example, I could email this from here or download it to my computer if I don't have the original on the computer I'm using. Now you can also have multiple attachments per row. So if there are several files that are relevant to this item or task, you can manage them all from one place. Just drag in the file or click the attach button at the bottom again. Now I do have another file that I wanna attach, but maybe in this case, I want to attach it to the business case row. So with it selected, I don't need to click the attachment button here. I can just simply click attach files to row two. And we'll upload a file again, and we'll select the 0401 brand story document. And there it is. By the way, if you are attaching files from one of the cloud-based services here, opening the attachment will always open the latest version of those files, so you don't have to worry about accidentally using an older version of the attachment. If you've uploaded a file stored on your computer and then you update that file, you can click the button here next to it, and then from the Actions menu, you can choose Upload New Version to select that file and automatically replace the older version. So now I have two attachments, one on row two and one on row four. If you want to see all of your attachments at once, click all here at the top of the attachments pane. You can also sort your listing of attachments by using this menu here. 
And if you want to see just the attachments in a certain row, click the row name under one of the attachments. So when I click the row four label, I now see all the files attached to row four. Now I mentioned that you can also attach files at the sheet level so they're not associated with any specific row. To do so, just click sheet at the top here. And notice here the button says attach files to sheet. Again, I'll browse for a file and I'll select the red 30 logo. And now I've attached this logo image at the sheet level. And again, I can see all the attachments by going to all. All right, so that's working with attachments in Smartsheet. All of your work in Smartsheet happens in Sheets. It's where all of the data you work with lives. So let's start by taking a look at how to create a new sheet. I'm logged into a new Smartsheet account, and again, I'm just using a free 30-day demo account here if you wanna do the same and follow along with me. And I haven't yet created any sheets. I'm gonna come down and click the plus button here on the left, which takes me to the Solution Center. Up here, I'm gonna make sure Create is selected. And this is where you can choose any of these templates to create a new sheet from scratch, or you can click Import to import data from Excel, Microsoft Project, Google Sheets, or Trello. For this example, let's go back to Create and look at these templates. So you can see we have several types of Smartsheet items here to start with. I'll open some of these up so you can get an idea of what they look like. For example, I'll select the Grid template, and I'll just leave the default name of New Sheet for now. So the grid template has no predefined columns. It's basically a blank document you can build completely from scratch. Notice they're just labeled primary column and then column two, three, four, and so on. I'm gonna to go to File, Delete to get rid of this for now. Or we can look at another template like the task template, which does have some predefined columns for task names, due dates, and so on. that. And you can check out the rest of these templates to see what they offer and choose the one that best suits the type of sheet you want to work with. For now, let's select the grid template again to look at how to build a sheet completely from scratch. I'm going to call this one quarterly projects and click OK. And we'll just close this panel here to the right so we have more room to look at the sheet itself. So now we have a blank sheet and we can start customizing these columns. It's important to name your columns properly because that's how you sort and manage the reports and forms and other data you can manage with your sheets. Probably the most important column, as its name implies, is the primary column. It'll contain key information about each row in your sheet. So for example, if I were using the sheet to manage an upcoming project that involves several separate tasks, I could double click this primary column header and I'll rename this column to task name. And then you can start entering the various tasks. I'll just type in a few here. And I'm just pressing enter or return each time to go down to the next cell. And I'm just gonna double click the divider between these two columns to expand the task name column so I can see all the text in here. Now in the second column, I may want to list the employees to assign these various tasks to. I'll double click it and I'll call this Assign To. Now we're also gonna designate this column type as a contact list. And we'll talk more in detail about choosing column types a little bit later. And then I can start entering the names of the people assigned to each task. Now, if you've imported your team's contact info into Smartsheet, the fields will autofill as you type. Notice as I start typing Nick, he is in my contact list, so I can just select him from here and he gets added in the assigned to column. But you can also just enter the person's name or their contact info. So it's important to designate each column with the right properties for the information that you want in those cells. For example, I'll call the next column status, and then I can choose the column type. Now this is up to you to determine the properties that work best. So I might choose, for example, symbols, which allows me to apply visual symbols to each cell to indicate, in this case, the status of each task. And it's up to you to determine what each symbol represents. For this example, I'll just select the red, yellow, green, and blue dots. Now, if I only want these symbols to appear in this column rather than allowing anyone to enter text as well, I can enable restrict to symbol values only but I'll leave that off in case someone needs to enter info that the symbols can't express. And I'll click okay. 
So now under this column, I can click this drop-down menu and set the status color for each row. Again, what each color indicates is up to you, but for example, maybe we're good to go with, say, the launch plan here. So I'll select green. And maybe for my project, blue indicates a completed status. So I'll come up to business case if that's done and select blue. Again, it's up to you to choose the best properties for each column. Now, if I find that this color system isn't working, I could come back and double click the heading and change the column type to say a drop down list. And I can delete the values that are in here and create my own. And when I click OK, I can come back in and select those values from the drop down list that appears in each cell of this column now. So maybe here for blue, I'll choose complete and green will be in progress. So you would continue this way, naming the columns you need and assigning the properties. I'll quickly name the next two columns. Call this one start date. And I'm going to designate this as a date field. And I'll make this next column due date. And also make it a date field as well. And I can enter the date either by typing the numbers or if I write it out, the date gets automatically formatted for consistency. Now, once you have your columns, you're free to rearrange them as needed. I could grab the status column, drag it to the left or move it back. And you can delete unneeded columns either by right clicking on them or by clicking the three dot button here to the right. And in this case, I'll choose delete column. Or if you need to add more columns, you can right click a column and choose to insert the column to the left or the right, which prompts you to give the column a name and select a column type. I'll just cancel that for now. But that's the basics of creating a new sheet from scratch in Smartsheet. One way to quickly find items or sort your sheet is by creating filters. This allows you to easily display just the items that match the criteria you're looking for. Now, before we look at filters, I'm just going to select these due dates here next to Jess and delete them. And we'll see why I'm doing that in just a moment. But now I'm going to come up to the filter menu to create a filter. So let's say, for example, that I'm looking for all the items that have been assigned to my teammate Jess. From the select field, I'm going to choose the assign to column. And from this middle menu, which currently says is one of, I'm going to leave that selected. But you can see we can select from several different conditions here. And from the select values menu, I'm going to select Jess. Now below that, I could continue adding criteria to narrow down my search. So for example, I could choose the due date column. And maybe I want to find all the items assigned to Jess that have yet to be given a due date. So I could choose is blank. Now, if you think this is a filter you'll be using a lot, you can give it a name so you can easily know what the filter does later. So I'll just call this assigned to Jess. And I'll click apply. And just like that, you can see that three rows met the conditions of the filter I created. And you can see the name of the filter here at the top. I'll click that again to turn the filter off. And that displays the entire sheet again. But at any time, I can now click the filter menu and select the assigned to just filter. And that way I can easily see the items that have been assigned to her that haven't yet been given a due date. I'll turn that off again. Now notice you can also roll over a filter here, which makes some buttons appear and I can choose to edit it if I want to make changes to it. I'll just cancel that for now. You can also duplicate filters if you want to base a new filter off an existing one. So maybe I also want to create a filter to see the items assigned to Nick. So all I need to do here is select his name from this menu and I'll deselect Jess. And maybe in this case, I want to display items that are in the future. So I'll select in the future. And I'll change the name of this filter to assign to Nick. And I'll click apply. Now, because none of his items have been assigned a due date, we see no results here. So if I turn that off, and I do assign one of these a future date, Now, when I turn the filter on, we see that it easily finds that item. And now I have two custom filters created. 
So that's how to create custom filters to sort your sheets and quickly locate items and tasks. Okay, so we've looked at setting up a new sheet with the necessary columns in Smartsheet. Now, rows in Smartsheet are another key element of your sheet, of course, because they contain each individual task or item and their status and other important info. Now, just so we have some more content in our cells here, I'm going to shift click rows one through five to select them. And I'll copy them with Command or Control C. And I'll click row six and paste with Command or Control V. And I'll do that one more time here, starting at row 11. And let's change these to Q4 planning and Q1 planning. Now, of course, your sheets will have real data with variations in the info, but we just need some content to work with here. All right, so on the left side of each row, we have an area where buttons appear when you roll your mouse over that row. So the first button here, this three dot button, is the row menu where you can find the options for inserting additional rows, locking rows to prevent changes, and so on. Now you can also see these commands by right-clicking on any row, which is easier and faster, so you probably won't use this menu too often here to the left. Now you can also insert rows and columns from the toolbar. Now because of the screen resolution I'm using to record this movie, I can't see the entire toolbar, but if I click the More menu here, that reveals additional tools, and from here I can insert a row or a column. So in this case, it's probably easier to right click on a row to add more rows. Now next we have the attachment button. Clicking that lets you browse for a file on your computer to attach to the row. For example, you could attach a product image or a supporting document for the item in this row from here so that your team members will be able to access them. Next we have the comment button, which opens up the comments panel. And this is a great place for your team to discuss the item in this row, maybe talking about its status or any potential roadblocks, and everyone will be able to keep track of the conversation from here. The next button here allows us to upload a proof. This is where you can upload content like PDF documents, images, videos, or Microsoft Office files for others on your team or for your clients to review. So for example, if Jess wanted the rest of us to check out her draft on her launch plan, she could attach a PDF of it to this row and anyone on the project or anyone she tags will be able to review it and add their notes and comments. It's another great way to keep everything in one place here in Smartsheet instead of having to send links to external documents that you then need to keep track of. Just close that for now. And the fifth menu here lets you set a reminder. This will let you set a date to receive a reminder about the item in this row so you can stay on top of this specific task or be reminded of important deadlines. Now, another great advantage of rows is the ability to organize them into a hierarchy, which can make your sheet easier to manage and navigate. So for example, in this sheet, we have rows with Q3 planning, Q4 planning, and Q1 planning. Let's say we want to use these as headers for the phases of our project. So under Q3, I'm going to select the business case row, and I'm going to click the indent button here in the toolbar. That makes the business case a child row of the Q3 planning row, also known as the parent row. And I can do the same thing for launch plan, demo, and marketing requirements. So Q3 planning is now the parent row to these four child rows below it. I'll quickly do the same thing for Q4 and Q1. Again, I can shift click to select contiguous rows and I'll just indent them all at once. And we'll do the same thing here. And once you have the parent and child relationship set up, you can collapse and expand rows as necessary. This can make it a lot easier to see or focus on the different phases of your project. Now you can also have multiple levels within your hierarchies. So for example, I can further indent demo and marketing requirements, which I might want to do if these are subtasks within the launch plan. Also be aware that any action you take on parent rows affect the associated child rows. So for example, if you want to move the launch plan up so it's the first item under Q4 planning, I can do that. And notice demo and marketing requirements move along with it. And if I were to delete this row, it would also delete the child rows as well. Adding a row under a parent row automatically makes it a child of that parent. So from here I can add a row. I'll do that below and we'll call this testing. 
and notice it's been indented to be part of the launch plan. Now, if you want to remove the parent-child relationship, you can just grab the rose handle and drag that down. And you can see it's now been outdented. Now, if you have a lot of parent and child rows, you might find it useful to format the parent rows with a color to make the hierarchy easier to see. Just select the parent row. And here in the toolbar, we can select a background color. I'll just select a light blue. Now quickly do the same here with the other parent rows. So you can see those parent rows are much easier to see now. And I think I do want to indent testing a bit here so it's still part of Q4. There we go. So as you can see, that's how rows and hierarchies can help you better manage your sheets. The last view available from the view menu in the toolbar is calendar view. And as you can probably tell by its name, this lets you view your task on a calendar. In order to use this view, you have to have at least one day column. In this case, I have the start and due date columns. So I'll select calendar view. And you can see the calendar appears and this calendar settings window opens on top of it. So from here, I could choose to display either by start date or due date, or whatever you have those day columns named in your sheet. You can also choose date ranges. And in this case, I'll display the ranges between these start and due dates. And when I click OK, the tasks are now displayed like this, showing their ranges on the calendar dates. Now, currently we're looking at the entire month, but you can click this time frame button up here where it currently says one month and choose any of these other time frames. I'll choose one week. And I can jump forward and back week by week with the arrows to either side. I'll just keep doing that until some content appears. Now this one week view can be useful if you have lots of items on single days. The other views are limited and might not be able to display all of your items the way the one week view can. I'll just switch back to one month in this case. Over here to the left, we have the mini calendars, which you can use to jump ahead to the upcoming months. The current range being displayed is highlighted in yellow here, so you can easily see that. And you can also use the scroll bar over here to scroll through the calendar. As with the other views we looked at, you can make edits and changes to your task from right here in calendar view. Just double click on the task. So if I needed to change the start or end date in this case, I could do so. And click OK and make that change. You can also drag the tasks bar on the calendar to quickly change the range of dates for that task or drag the start or end of the bar to change the start or end dates. Now, of course, we all have our preferred calendar apps and it can be good to be able to see the tasks in your sheet alongside other items that might be on your personal or work calendars. You can publish your Smartsheet calendar to Google Calendar by clicking this button up here, publish to Google Calendar. And by enabling this, you'll be prompted to sign into your Google Calendar account. And you can follow the steps to publish your Smartsheet calendar to your Google Calendar, and then you'll be able to see your tasks in your Google Calendar. I'll just close that for now. Alternately, you can also download your Google Calendar into your Smartsheet if you prefer to see all of your tasks and appointments here in Smartsheet. Just click this overlay Google Calendar button, enable this feature, and again, walk through the steps to set this up. If you don't use Google Calendar, you can publish an iCal version of your Smartsheet by clicking this button here. And then you can enable Calendar. And here I can click Add to my Calendar, or I could use this Publish link to subscribe to my Smartsheet from my preferred calendar app like Microsoft Outlook or Apple Calendar. So that's how to work with Calendar View in Smartsheet. In addition to this grid view of our sheet we've been working with so far, Smartsheet offers three other ways to view your sheets that can help you and your team better understand, see, and act on the tasks in your projects. You can see these other options by clicking this menu here that currently shows grid view. And in this movie, I want to take a look at the card view. But before we do that, we need to complete more of the information in this sheet. Card view is a way to prioritize and organize the tasks in your list. In order to use card view, your sheet needs to have a drop-down list, a contact list, or a symbols column. Now we do have a drop-down list in the status column, as we've previously set up. And I've already made sure that a status has been applied to each row. I've also filled in names for all of the rows under the assign to column. So again, to use card view, you need to have at least a drop-down list, a contact list, or a symbols column. 
So we now have a column with contacts and dropdowns, but let's also add a symbols column. We saw how to create a symbols column earlier, so I'm going to right click on the status column and choose insert column right. Let's talk about the health of the task. And we'll set the column type to symbols. And I'll choose the red, yellow, green symbols. I'll click OK. And there's our new column. And I'll choose some symbols for each row here under Q3 planning. And just to save some time, I'm going to copy this and paste it into the other sections. So Command C and then Command V and Command V again. And I'll just change a few of these quickly. And again, this is just so we have something to look at. All right, so let's take a look now at card view. I'll click the grid view menu and choose card view. With that enabled, the sheet is now displayed as a board organized into these lanes, which are based on the values in your drop-down list, contact list, or symbol list, depending on which of them you have. In this case, we're viewing the cards based on their status, which you can see here by the menu at the top that says view by status. But from this menu, you can also choose to view the cards based on their health, which we just set up, or who they're assigned to. What you see in this menu depends on which items your sheet contains. So basically in card view, each row in the grid is represented by an individual card, and you can drag them up and down in their lanes to adjust their priorities. So for example, if I were viewing this by health, and I wanted to move this business case up, I could just drag it like so. Or you can move them between lanes. So maybe this yellow task can now be set to green. And this will update the health of this task to green without me having to switch back to grid view and selecting green from that menu. You can also double click on any card to access its information, which is the same information you see for that row in grid view. And you can make changes in here as well. Maybe I want to assign this to Ashley instead of Jess. I'll click OK, and that's done. By the way, you can even add attachments or comments to the card from here. And any changes you made are updated in real time, so anyone else on your team viewing the sheet in their own devices will have the most up-to-date info. Here in the upper right, you can switch to a compact view, which makes it easier to see more tasks at once when you want to check out a broader view of your project. I'll just switch that back. Also from here, you can click the Settings button, and this is where you can customize the fields that are displayed in the cards. So for example, if I don't need to see the Assigned To info, I could deselect that, and when I click OK, that information is no longer displayed in card view. You can also add new cards by clicking the plus button at any time and then clicking the edit button. So maybe I have a task called social media posts. I'll assign that to Ashley. We'll say that it's in progress. I'll leave everything else as is and click OK. And there it is. And now if we switch back to grid view, there's the new row from the card that I just added. And I'll just indent that to make sure that's part of the Q1 planning. All right, so that's a look at card view in Smartsheet. Another useful way to view your sheets is in the Gantt view. Gantt view offers a timeline-based view of your work, giving you a visual representation of your schedule and the relationship between tasks. In order to use Gantt view, you have to have at least two date-based columns in your sheet, like we do here, in this case with start date and due dates. I've already gone through and entered dates for each of those columns, so let's come up here to where it currently says grid view and switch to Gantt view. That displays the Gantt view here on the right side of the sheet, and you can see that each task is represented by a bar in the chart. If you need to see more of the chart, you can grab the divider here and drag that to the left. There's also a zoom out button up here to let you see more of the timeline. Or you can zoom in for a closer look at the relationship between tasks. Basically, we have four zoom levels, quarter, month, week, and day. In Gantt view, if you need to change the dates of a task, you can either drag the entire bar to move the start and end date simultaneously while keeping the length of the task the same, or you can drag either end to change the start or end date. 
and that automatically updates the date info in the sheet itself. You can also right-click on a bar to open up color settings, and from here you can change its color. Color coding your bars is a good way to keep visual track of a task's status or importance, or whatever significance you want to place on the colors. So that's a quick look at the Gantt view in Smartsheet. So it should be fairly clear by now that a big advantage of using Smartsheet is the multitude of ways it lets you view your projects and tasks, giving choices to best interpret and act on the data by viewing it in grid view, card view, and so on. Another way to have Smartsheet help you better visualize or focus on important data is through conditional formatting. Conditional formatting can automatically make the key information in your chart more visible based on the rules you set up as the sheet's admin. For example, this sheet I've been working on has a lot of dollar values. Maybe I want to be able to easily see when any total spending in the quarter goes over $10,000. To do so, I can set up a conditional formatting rule. We start by clicking the conditional formatting button up here in the toolbar. And here I'll click Add New Rule. So the way this is set up is to set a condition, and if that condition is met, to then have Smartsheet apply formatting of your choice to the row or column that meets that condition. So I'll first select Set Condition. Then I'll choose the column this row will apply to. In this case, I'll choose the total column. Next, we choose the criteria. Now, it's pulling content from the cells in this case, but that's not useful for what we're trying to do here. So I'm going to click Define Custom Criteria. This allows me to then select from this menu that currently says Contains, but from here I can choose the criteria that best matches what I'm trying to set the rule up to do. So I'll choose Is Greater Than, since I want to set up a rule that formats cells containing values greater than $10,000. If necessary, you can add additional criteria. So for example, if I wanted to also highlight cells that were left blank, I could choose that. But I'll leave this as is for now, and click OK. Now that I've established the criteria, I can choose the format to apply to any cell that meets it. For this example, I'll click the Fill Color button, and let's choose a light red. And you can see in the background here that that's already been applied. Now some of the format options here only apply to certain views. For example, the Taskbar Color format applies when you're viewing your sheet in Card View, but you won't see any changes in Grid View. By default, the formatting applies to the entire row, but I can click here where it says Entire Row and choose to apply the formatting to just the cells in any of these columns. So I'll select Total and click OK. And I'll click OK again. And there we have it. So now, instead of having to visually scan for the numbers I'm looking for, I've set up a rule to automatically format those cells that meet those criteria. And of course, if any of these numbers change, the conditional formatting automatically applies. Now you can also edit existing rules by opening the conditional formatting window again. So if I wanted to change this to only highlight cells that are over 15,000, I can just click the criteria, make that change, click OK, and that's immediately applied. Now you can also set multiple criteria that looks at multiple columns to meet your conditions. This is different than clicking the existing criteria and adding from this menu, because this only applies to the selected column. So let's say I want to highlight cells in which the amount is over 15,000, but also where the percent of total is over 15%. So I'll come over here to this menu and click Add Condition. Notice that adds an AND and a Set Condition option here. So I'll click Set Condition. I'll select the percent of total column. And here I'll set the criteria to be is greater than 0 0.15. I'll click OK and OK again. And now that's applied, and it will only highlight fields that are both greater than 15,000 and make up more than 15% of the total. So you can come up with some pretty intricate rules to highlight the content you're looking for. If at any point you want to hide the conditional formatting you've set up, just open up the conditional formatting window again, click the menu next to the rule, and choose to disable it. And you can re-enable it again at any time. As we've seen, conditional formatting rules can be really useful in helping you quickly identify important data in your sheets, but they can also be a bit time-consuming to set up, especially if you're creating a lot of rules. Fortunately, it's easy to copy existing rules and modify them. I'm going to go back and open the sheet we were working on earlier by coming over here to Browse 
and I'll open up the quarterly projects sheet we had open earlier. So let's say I want to establish some rules that format the rows that have been assigned to certain team members. As before, I can open up the conditional formatting window and click add a new rule. So for this rule, I'll set a condition and choose the assign to column. And then I can choose the person from the list on the right that Smartsheet has grabbed from the people listed in that column so far. I'll choose Jess and I'll click OK. Next, I'll choose the format and apply a light green color to the fill. And you can see that applies automatically to any row with tasks that are assigned to Jess. So now if I wanted to create similar rules for other team members, I don't have to do so from scratch. I can use this rule I just created as a starting point and modify a clone of it. I just need to click this menu to the left of the rule and choose Clone Rule. You can see that creates a duplicate, and now I can just change the parts of the rule that allow me to apply it to another team member. In this case, I just need to click the criteria. I'll select Nick and deselect Jess. I'll click OK. You can see that's already being applied, but I don't want them to be the same color in this case. So I'll apply the format for Nick and I'll choose a different fill color, maybe a light yellow. So it's that easy. And just as a reminder, you can add conditions to existing rules. So for example, if I wanted to only highlight tasks assigned to Jess that were delayed, I can click the menu. I can go back to conditional formatting, click the menu next to her rule and choose Add Condition. Here, I'll click the new condition, and I'll select the Status column, and choose Delayed. I'll click OK. Now, we don't see anything highlighted right now because none of Jess's tasks are delayed. But if I come down here, and I changed this one's status to Delayed, you can see it's automatically highlighted in green now. So again, conditional formatting is a huge help for quickly visualizing or finding the important data in your sheets. If you're familiar with spreadsheet programs like Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets, you're probably aware of the ability to use formulas, which allow you to automatically perform calculations within your sheets. Formulas can help you to gain insights on your data, and Smartsheet offers this ability as well. So let's take a look at the basics of working with formulas here in Smartsheet. I'm going to go down to the plus button to open up the Solution Center, and I'll make sure Import is selected here. For this exercise, I've included an Excel spreadsheet we can import so we don't have to manually enter a bunch of data. So I'll click Microsoft Excel, select, I'll browse for 0201 formulas from my exercise files folder, and click Continue. Now when you import a file, you can choose a sheet name. I'm just going to change this to just formulas. And then you can select the row in your sheet that contains your column headers. I'm going to leave the top row selected for that reason. I'll also make sure the first column, the city column here, is selected as the primary column. We also have the option here to include any existing formulas when you import the file, which can save you time. Now this file doesn't contain any formulas, so it doesn't matter if I leave that selected. I'll click Import. All right, so now we've imported this data from the Excel file. I'm just gonna double click the border between city and January here so I can expand this column and we can see everything. So you can create a formula in most types of fields, including text number fields, contact list fields, date fields, drop-down list fields, and symbol fields. So for example, I'll select this first field under January in the total row. Now all formulas start by adding an equal sign to the field. Then you just type in your equation. So for example, I could type something like six asterisk five, and when I press enter, that gets calculated, and in this case, the product of 30 is displayed but you generally won't be adding formulas of this sort to your sheets. In most cases, you'll probably want to calculate the values of other fields in your sheets together. So I'll double click in this field again and just delete that. Generally, to calculate the data from multiple fields together, you'll use specific functions. You can find a list of available functions at help.smartsheet.com functions. And here you can scroll through and browse these functions. Again, if you're familiar with working with formulas in Excel or Google Sheets, you'll find most of the same functions are available in Smartsheet, and you'll also find some functions that are exclusive to Smartsheet. And if you're looking for a specific function, you can perform a keyword search on this page. So for example, I know I want to add together multiple fields on my sheet to automatically calculate the sum. So I might search for sum. And that gives me these results, and I can see that I want to use is sum, which adds together a series of numbers. 
under the syntax column, we can see how to properly format the equation. In this case, I would type sum followed by the numbers I want to add together inside of parentheses. But in most cases, you don't have to manually enter your entire formula. Let's see how this works. So in this first total field, I'll again type an equal sign to indicate that I'm entering a formula here. Then I'll type SU. And notice as you type, Smartsheet suggests possible functions. And if I select sum, I see this tip that can help guide me through writing a complete formula. I'll just click out of that for a moment. So in this case, I want to add up the cost listed here under the January column. So I'll double click back in this field again. Notice it adds both the opening and closing parentheses for me. And we have several different ways to add the information that we want to calculate. Now I need to actually see my column here, so I'm just going to click over here for a moment. But notice when I click San Francisco, it adds city one. So the column of city, the row of one. That's not what I want in this case. I want to start here in the, in the January column with row one. And notice that's added to the formula. And then I can hold down shift and click the amount next to Boston, and that selects everything in between as well. Notice it now says January 1, call in January 7. Alternately, I can type sum and just drag over the range of cells I want to calculate. If I wanted to select non-contiguous cells, I would hold down Command on the Mac or Control on Windows. But in this case, I just want the entire range of January. So let's delete that. And we'll just drag down through that range again. And as you might have already seen, when I leave that field, that sum is instantly calculated. And of course, this sum will automatically update if info is changed. Smartsheet is also smart enough to know that if you add a new row immediately before, after, or within the rows you're calculating, the new row will automatically inherit that formula. So if I right click on the Dallas row and insert below, and say we add New York, and I'll put an amount in here. You can see that's added to the sum. If you use hierarchies in your sheets, Smartsheet can automatically calculate the child rows. So for example, if I add a row above the cities, and I'll call this US cities, and then select and indent all the cities below to create a hierarchy, I can use the children function. I'll click in this row above the values for February, for example, and I'll type equals sum, open parentheses, children, open parentheses, close parentheses, and that gives me the sum of all the child rows under the parent row. And if I add more data, that new data is incorporated into that total. Now, in addition to manually typing an equal sign and then the function you want to use, you can also come up to the menu. Now, in this case, I need to click the More button here. But this is where I'll find the Functions menu. And from here, you can select the function you want to use. So if I wanted to calculate the sum of all the San Francisco sales here, I would click in this total field. Come over here to Functions, select Sum from the menu, and then just drag through these three cells. And when I click outside of there, there's our total. So that's the basics of working with formulas in Smartsheet. If you haven't worked with formulas much, you can come back up to the Formulas menu and come down to the bottom and select Reference to return to the Smartsheet website and spend some time reviewing the available functions and how they're used. Previously, we looked at how to set up formulas, and we worked pretty much with sums, adding up the total fields in this sheet. So let's take a look at a different function just so we have an idea of how to do something other than sums. Now, one really nice thing about working with formulas is that you can copy and paste them to other cells, and Smartsheet is smart enough to know to change the formulas for the new rows or columns that you're pasting them into. So I could select and copy the total cell here under January with Command or Control C, then come over here and paste it under February. And notice the formula automatically calculated the February totals. And if I double click, you can see the formula there. And I can do the same thing here with March. And in this total column, I can paste here for the grand total of this column. 
Now we also need to get the totals for each city here. So again, I could select this cell where we have this formula, copy it and paste it in the cell below and continue that way throughout the rest of the column. I'm gonna undo that twice to get rid of that for a moment and show you another way we can do this. If I select the cell and select this little handle in the lower right hand corner, I can drag down and instantly apply that formula to all of these cells at once. So that's a little faster than copying and pasting. But as you can see, it's pretty easy to copy a formula from cell to cell. But now how do we create this formula for the cells in the percent of total column? Well, the percent of the total is going to be the value in the total field divided by the grand total down here. So how do we express that in a formula? Let's take a look. I'll select the first cell here in the San Francisco row. Now we know that all formulas start with an equal sign. And again, this cell is going to be the total here in row two divided by the total in row 12. So I'll click in the cell, which automatically writes total at row for me, indicating the total cell for this particular row. I'm gonna manually enter the division symbol, which is the forward slash, and then select the grand total cell. And now when I press enter, there's the value expressed as a decimal. But I want this to display as a percentage. So with the cell selected, I wanna click the percentage button in the toolbar. And because of the resolution I'm recording at, I need to come over here to the more area, but here's where we'll find percentage format. And now that switches out to 14%. Now I can't currently copy and paste this particular formula because I'm working with a formula where only one cell selection is changing. Notice what happens if I copy the cell and paste it into the next row. If I double click to see the formula, you can see it shifts the calculated row to row 13 but I need it to stay on row 12. So I'm gonna undo that. Now I could work my way down and manually add the formulas for the rest of the column, but here's a quick trick. I'm gonna double click this formula again. And in front of where it currently says total 12, I'm gonna add a dollar sign. I'm also gonna get rid of these spaces for now. But the dollar sign creates what's known as an absolute reference, meaning when I copy and paste this formula, it's going to take the total of the row and continue to divide it by the value in total row 12 instead of shifting it down a row. So when I press enter, you can see that it's still calculating this row properly. I'll double click in it again, and I'm just gonna select the entire contents of the formula, copy it, and I'll paste this formula into the next cell and the one below that, and so on. And each one is gonna take the total of the row it's in and divide it by the total value in row 12. All right, so that's how to add a percentage formula as well as how to format it to display it as a percentage. All right, so continuing from where we left off, I previously mentioned that even though the form fields are generated from the column headers in your sheet, you can also create additional fields. Over here on the left, we have this fields area and here you'll find any columns you've removed, like the returning customer one we got rid of earlier. If you wanna add it back, you can just drag it back to the right and place it where you want. Let's leave it out for now. We also have this form elements section where you can drag other items into the form, like additional headings or divider lines, or an element to allow the user to upload a file or document along with the form when they submit it. You can also just click a form element to add it to the bottom of the form. So for example, I'll click file upload and that gets added here below the other fields we have so far. With it selected, I can change its label. I'll call it sample file, and we can add some help text. And the user will be able to drag their file right into this field or browse for the file on their computer. Now you can also come over here and click the new field button to generate a form field that will add a new column to your sheet. So if you forgot to include a column in your sheet before creating your form, you can do so from here. I'll create a drop-down list, and we'll call it contact preference. And in the values field, we'll add phone and email. I'll click OK. And now you can see it's been added to the available fields over here on the left. But if I wanna use it, I'll still need to add it to this particular form. So maybe I'll just grab that and drag it right to here. Now, once you have your fields added and customized, you can rearrange them as necessary. Maybe I want to move email up here. 
And as my form starts to get more complex, I may want to add section dividers and descriptions to make it easier to use. So for example, I can grab this heading slash description piece, and I'll drag this above first and last name, and I'll call it contact info. And maybe here above the start date, I'll add another heading, and we'll call this project info. And I'll grab a divider line, and we'll just place that above company size. Now these dividers aren't really necessary, but it can give your form a cleaner, more professional look. Okay, so now we've seen that you can add form fields for columns that didn't exist in your sheet. And of course, you can also keep adding columns to your sheet. Let's go back to the sheet. So we already have this contact preference that you can see has been added since we created that in the form. If necessary, you can add more columns to help you better manage the data that comes in from the form. I'll right click on contact preferences and add another column to the right. Let's say I wanna be able to log the date on which the forms are submitted. I'll call this submitted. And for the column type, we'll select created date. And this will automatically place the date into the row whenever form field data is submitted from the form. I'll click okay. And maybe I also want a column so the form request can be assigned to specific team members. I'll create another new column to the right. We'll call this assigned to and we'll make it a contact list. Okay, so these two new columns only appear on the sheet and have no effect on the form we created because we created them after the form. It might be useful to format the columns for internal use a little bit differently so you can quickly distinguish them from the user submitted content. So for example, we mentioned earlier that returning customer would be a internal column. So I'll move that to the right so these three internal columns are all together. And then I'll shift click to select all three of these. And I'll change the fill color to say a light green. And that way we'll be easily able to see the fields that are created for internal use only. Okay, so our form and its sheet are getting close to being complete. Next we'll add a few more fields to it. In Smartsheet, you can easily set up notifications so you or your team will receive an alert as soon as a user submits one of your forms. With notifications, you can act on the incoming data as quickly as possible. I'm still working with the same sheet we've been using to create our form, and I'll come up and click the Automation menu. This is where you can set up automated workflows that trigger when certain events happen in your sheet. You can create a workflow based on a template. For example, here under Notifications and Reminders, you can send a message to a Slack or a Teams channel when certain criteria are met, or alert someone when a row is deleted from the sheet. In this case, I'll choose Alert Someone When Specified Criteria Are Met. This gives us a preview and description of the ways you can use this template. I'll click Use Template. And that opens this workflow window. I'll give this workflow the title of New Form Submission. So at their most basic, workflows are based on triggers. When something you specify happens on the sheet, that triggers the series of events you set up. In this case, I want to set it up so that whenever someone submits info through this form, it'll add a new row to the sheet. So here at the top, I'll make sure the trigger is set to when rows are added. Below that, I can be more specific by saying to run the workflow only when specific fields change in certain ways. But in this case, as long as a new row has been added, that means a new form submission has occurred, so I want to run the workflow when triggered. And in this case, the first and only workflow is set to alert someone. And here, send to specific people is selected. If I click that menu, you can see we have other options available like send to contacts in a cell, or send to everyone shared to the sheet, and so on. I'll select that option so everyone on my team gets a notification when a form is submitted. And you can add a customized message if you like. You can click the plus button to add other actions you may want to trigger, but I'll leave this as is and click save. So here we can see a summary of the workflow and its steps. When rows are added, all shared users of the sheet will receive an alert. If you click this three dot menu to the right, you can see options to deactivate this workflow temporarily, to edit it, or you can duplicate it to base a new workflow on it. I'll just leave everything here as is and go back to the sheet. And now I and my team will receive a notification email anytime a customer submits a project request through this form. 
Okay, so far in this chapter, we've built our form, added additional fields and columns, and we've set up alerts for when form data is submitted. But we haven't really looked at the form itself yet. Let's come up to the Forms menu again, and I'll select Manage Forms. And here I'll select the form to go into Edit Mode again. And from here, let's click Settings at the top. So here we have options that control the user's experience. Here at the top, you can choose one of three looks for the form itself. If you want to see what they look like when applied, just choose one. We've got Vertical selected right now. And here I'll click Open Form. So this is the vertical look. We can close that tab. Here's Side by Side, which places the form on the right side of the screen with the title on the left. And the plain version looks as you might expect, very plain. Let's go back and keep Side by Side selected for this example. By the way, you can take the Smartsheet branding off your form if you're using a paid account. I'm just using the trial account right now, so that option is currently grayed out. Next, we can decide if the form is accessible by anyone with a link to the form, or only by registered Smartsheet users who will need to sign into their accounts in order to access the form. It really depends on if your form is outward-facing to clients or internally to your own company or other Smartsheet users. For a form like this one, I'm not going to require anyone to log into Smartsheet to access the form. Next, you can enable CAPTCHA software to confirm that the users are humans and not bots, if that's a concern for this form. Under Form Submission, you can customize the message the user will see when they submit the form. You might want to add something like, thank you, we'll be in touch very soon, or something similar. I'll just leave the default success message here. Alternately, you can choose to reload the same form for another entry if this form is one that users may need to fill out multiple times, for example, if they're in charge of entering registration info for an event. Or you can send the users to a link and then enter the web address of the site you want to direct them to. I'll leave display this confirmation message selected. Now, as far as what happens to the form data that's submitted, under the new submissions should appear on the area, you specify where the form data is entered on the sheet, either at the top or the bottom, whichever works best for you. And then you have the option to let users opt in to receive a copy of the form via email after they submit the form. Again, you can customize the text here if you like. All right, so that takes care of the form options. I think this form is ready to be made public, so let's make sure the form is active up here. And we'll click Save. And we'll go back to the Form tab here. And again, you can preview the form by clicking Open Form. So this shows you what users will see and experience when they fill out your form. So I'll just fill out the form here a bit. Here's the conditional logic field we set up earlier. I'll say email, that makes the email field appear. So you'll want to make sure that all the other fields are behaving as expected. I can see the start date displays a calendar, and I can choose a date here. I can choose the company size from the drop-down list. I can upload a file, and so on. And when I'm done here, I can click Submit. There's the default confirmation message we saw earlier. I'll close this tab. And now when we come back to the sheet and reload it, we can now see the data that's been submitted through the form. And because of the workflow I set up under automation earlier, I can come over here to notifications, and I can see there is now a notification telling me that a new project request has been submitted. And because of the way we set this up earlier, everyone on my team will receive a notification about this new project submission. So if everything is working the way it should, I can share the form to the public. Now again, I'm using a demo account here, so I can't actually publish my form, but to do so with a paid account, you can come back to the Forms menu to Manage Forms, roll over your form to access the three-dot menu, and from here, you can choose to send a link to the form via email, you can copy the address of the form, or you can choose to copy the embed code to copy and paste the code for the form into a web page or elsewhere. So that's a look at working with forms in Smartsheet. With Smartsheet, you can create forms to make it easier and faster to collect data. After creating a form, you can share it with a web link so team members, clients, or anyone else can easily submit information and files that are collected and saved directly in your sheet. You can create forms for things like event registrations, customer feedback, surveys, and more. 
Let's start by creating a new form. I'll click the plus button to go to the Solution Center. And I have an Excel file we can import that has some column headers already created for us. Select it here, it's 0301 Project Request Form. And I'll just shorten its name here. And I'll leave everything else the way it is and click Import. All right, so let's say we're creating a form that customers or potential customers can use to request design work from my company. You can see this sheet already has columns in place to store data like their contact info, the project description, their company size, and so on. Having some columns already created before you create your form can make it easier to put the form together, but it's not necessary to have a column for everything you want before you start your form. You do have to begin from a sheet though. To create our form, we'll choose Forms, Create Form, that opens up the form editor. And by default, the form uses the same title as the sheet, but you're free to change it if you want. Right now it's just project request form. Let's change this to Red30 project request form. I'll leave the description blank for this example. So here we see a preview of the form fields that have been automatically generated from our column headers. You can modify each of these fields with a custom label if need be. So for example, with the name field selected here, maybe I'll change its label to first and last name. Each field can also include help text, which will appear below the field label. So for this name field, we might type, please enter your full name. And as you can see, we see a preview of what this will look like as you make changes. Now what you see here on the right side of the form editor is determined by the column types you assigned in the sheet. Right now, all of these fields are regular text fields, so as I select each one, the options here on the right don't really change. Let's click Save for a moment, and I'm going to go back to the sheet. Just close that for now, and I'm going to quickly go through and set a few column types. For example, I'll double click the email column, and we should set that as a contact list. I'll select the start date and set that as a date column. For company size, I'm gonna choose drop down list. And down here at the bottom, I'm gonna enter values for the list. Say one to 100, 200 to 499, and 500 plus. And in the returning customer column, I wanna be able to note if this person is a previous customer. I'm gonna set this as a checkbox column, and I'll just choose the star symbol in this case. Okay, so now that we've defined the columns, let's go back to creating the form and see how it's affected our options. I'll go back to Forms, Manage Forms this time, and I'll select the form we started. So the name and phone fields are still regular text fields. But when I select the email field, we lose the display as options because we set this up as a contact list field. Notice if I select phone again, we have this display as option here. But when I select email, we don't have that. Now we can still customize its appearance. Maybe I wanna add the help text of required. This way the user knows they have to add an email address to the field. But to actually enforce this, I need to actually select required down here. Notice that places an asterisk by the field label. Now the start date is now a date field. So instead of a field where they can just type text, we actually have a date picker. So they can choose the start date from a calendar. Now the project description field is still a text field, but describing their project will probably take more than a single line of text. So here I'll select multi-line text box. And you can choose how many lines of text you want to display at once. Maybe I'll make this four lines. And if it's longer than that, the box will be scrollable. I can also enter a default value here that can provide further instructions or examples. And we can see that the company size field is a drop-down list. You can choose to display this as a drop-down list or as radio buttons, both in vertical and horizontal configuration. In this case, I'll leave it as a drop-down list. Now the last field is the returning customer field, but let's say this is more for internal use. I want my team to use this field, but I don't want it on the form itself. 
you can remove any fields from the form by clicking the trash button. Now that only removes it from the form and not from the sheet. Notice it still appears here as an available field that I can add to the form here under fields. All right, so that's how to create a form using the columns in your sheet as a starting point. We'll continue adding to this form next. Sometimes when building forms, you'll want to make sure that certain questions or responses only appear if they're relevant to the person filling out the form. For example, on this form, we have a contact preference field. And above that, we have fields for email and phone. Maybe in this case, instead of having both of those fields show up on the form, we only want to display the field that the user prefers to use. We can accomplish this by setting up what's called conditional logic in the form. So with the contact preference field selected, over here on the right, I'll select the logic tab. And you can read here that this allows me to make sure the right questions are presented at the right time. I'll click add logic. Now here at the top, I can specify that when this contact preference field is, is not, is any of, and so on. Basically when the condition I set is met, then these specific fields here in the second menu should be displayed. So in this case, I'll keep is selected. So if the user selects email, then I want to display the email field. And you can actually have it display multiple fields if necessary. I just need email in this case though. So I'll click add to add that conditional logic. Now I also need to set up the logic for when phone is selected. So I'll click add rule. And again, when contact preference is phone, show the following fields, phone. I'll click add. All right, so those are the two rules I've set up for the contact preferences field. Now bear in mind that once you've set up conditional logic, fields mentioned in the rules will only show up if the conditions you set have been met. Any data in those fields will only be submitted if they're being displayed when the form is sent. So if the user chooses email, fills out their email address, but then changes their mind and chooses phone, the data in the email field won't be sent. You also wanna make sure that the form itself is set up in a logical, natural manner. So right now it would make more sense to move the contact preferences field above the email and phone fields. Also, this email field is currently set to required. I'm gonna turn off the required switch because we don't want it to be required if the user selects phone. I'll also remove the required help text here. And now we can test our conditional logic by clicking open form. We'll make sure to save. So here we're previewing the form and notice that neither the email nor the phone field initially shows up. But when I select either option from the contact preference field, the corresponding field shows up. So that's pretty cool. I'm gonna close this tab. So there are many ways you can use conditional logic. Maybe you're offering a range of products, but only some of the versions come in different colors. You could set up conditional logic so that if the user selects one of those products, a menu with color options appears, but that menu will stay hidden unless those particular products are selected. So that's how to set up conditional logic in your Smartsheet forms. There will be times when you'll want to share more than just a few rows of a single Smartsheet or even an entire collection of Smartsheets. Sometimes you want to focus on specific data across multiple sheets that your team may need to do their jobs. That's where the dashboard feature can come into play. Dashboards allow you to design a live interface to display critical information from your sheets and reports that you can then share with anyone who needs the data. Basically, they allow you to centralize all the important info and resources in one location. So let's take a look at how to create a dashboard. I'm here on the home screen in Smartsheet. Let's click the plus button to go to the Solution Center. And here I'll select create, and let's select dashboard slash portal. We're prompted to give the dashboard a name. Be sure to give it a good descriptive name so you'll be able to know exactly what it contains later when you might have several dashboards to work with. I'll call this Q1 data, and I'll click okay. Next we're prompted to add a widget. Widgets are what contain and display the data you wanna share in your dashboards. So I could click add widget from here, but just in case you don't see the screen, I'll click the pencil or edit button up here. And that takes us into the dashboard, which at this point is just a blank canvas. But over here on the right, I can click the plus button to add a widget. And this is exactly what I would have seen if I had clicked that add widget button a moment ago. So here we have the different widgets we can add to our dashboard and customize. You can add whichever and as many of these as you like and drag them around on the canvas in any way that makes sense to you and the people who will be using the dashboard. Probably a good place to start is with the title widget. 
Clicking that adds it to my dashboard. I can click inside of it and add a title. And you can format the text in it just like in a word processor. I can select it and maybe I'll change this to a larger font. And maybe I'll change the color. Then I can click outside of it and drag it anywhere on my dashboard. Next, decide what other widgets you want to add to the dashboard. For example, maybe I want to keep a chart here to show how these sales in certain cities are doing. I'll close this, click the plus button, and I'll click chart. And I'll come over here to the right and click add data. Here I need to select a data source, and I'm going to open up the workspace we created earlier, and I'll select the formula sheet. This is another sheet we were working with earlier, and that displays the data in that sheet. So maybe I want to show the numbers from San Francisco. I'll select the cells in that row for January, February, and March, and I'll click OK. And now the data is charted in the widget. And again, I can then customize the widget. For example, I can click this menu here under Chart Type, and I can choose to make this a bar chart, or a column chart, or a stack column, or a pie chart, and so on. I think I like column in this case. And I'll select title, and I'll change the title to San Francisco. There's also a widget behavior area down here that lets you choose what happens when someone clicks on the widget. I could have it open the data source, or a Smartsheet item, or a website. I'll leave it set to take no action for now, but this will be live data here in the dashboard. So if these numbers change in the sheet, the graph will also change to reflect that. And again, if I click outside the widget, I can drag it around on my canvas. I can resize it and just find somewhere to place it. And then I could continue adding widgets my team or other users might find useful. As another example, I can add the metric widget to display key data. So with that added, I'll click Add Data. I'll select the Formulas sheet again. This time I'll select the total sales number. And just like that, it's added to the widget. And again, I can customize its appearance and location. Maybe I'll make this a stacked layout like so. And I'll select the text here, make this a little bit bigger. And maybe I also want to change the color. I'll change its title to total sales. And once again, I can resize it and move it around. So maybe I want this centered at the top of my dashboard, like so. And then underneath it, I can put the key city information underneath that. But again, you're free to place anything in any location or size on the canvas. Let's take a look at one more. We have a shortcut widget. And this is providing links to commonly used items. When I click Add Shortcut, I can choose a website, an attachment, or a Smartsheet item. So if there's a file or a website or a sheet that my team needs quick access to, I can provide it here. I'll select Smartsheet Item and select one of my sheets. I'll go with Quarterly Projects. And there it is. And you can add multiple shortcuts. Maybe I'll add a website here. And we'll put in Smartsheet.com. And we'll title this Smartsheet Website. And I'll add a title of Quick Links. And currently I only have these two, so it doesn't need to be this big. I'll just make it a little bit smaller. And in this case, maybe we can just tuck this down in the corner. But once your dashboard has been set up, you'll click Save. And to share it with your team or with others, just click Share. And you'll see the usual options to share it to individuals or groups, and you can choose whether the people you share it with will be admins who can change or edit the dashboard, or viewers who can view and interact with the dashboard but can't change it. 
Alternately, you can also go to File, Publish, and send out a read-only version that anyone can view if they don't have a Smartsheet account or login. Just copy the address you see here, and you can paste it into a message or an email and so on. I'll just copy it with Command-C. So now if I open up another web browser where I'm not logged in to Smartsheet, and I paste in that address, here's the dashboard with its most current data, and I can click the links in the resources to open up the Smartsheet. In this case, I do need an account to see the sheet, but I can also click the link to go to the Smartsheet website. So you can share this address with anyone who needs to see or access the info in your dashboard. And that's how to set up a dashboard in Smartsheet. Working with Smartsheet is all about easily sharing data in your sheets with your team, with clients, or with any other internal or external stakeholders. In this chapter, we'll take a closer look at how sharing works in Smartsheet. I've opened up the first sheet we worked on back in the first chapter, so we have something to look at, but it doesn't really matter what sheet you open to follow along with me. Let's click the Share button. Now, before we get into the sharing options, it's important to understand permission levels. First of all, sharing permission levels are set by the person who shares the item. When you share an item with someone, they'll need to log into Smartsheet to access it. And you can stop sharing an item or change a collaborator's permission level at any time. We'll find the permission menu up here. So starting from the bottom of this list, a viewer can only see the sheet itself. They can see its entire contents, but they can't edit or change the document in any way. They can only read it. Next, we have the commenter level. Commenters basically have the same permissions as a viewer in that they can read everything in the sheet, but they can also add and delete their own comments and attachments, but they can't make any changes to the sheet's contents in any way. Next, we have two types of editor levels, can share and cannot share, which is fairly self-explanatory. Cannot share means they can't share the sheet with others, and can share means they can. Other than that, the editor level means they can edit the sheet by typing in cells or add comments to it or attach files and so on but editors can't change the position of locked columns. And users with admin permissions can do everything an editor can do, as well as change the column layout, and they can also edit content in locked rows and columns, and also share the content with others. So keep the permission levels in mind when you share your sheets, and remember that if you're sharing to a group, everyone in the group receives the same permission level, and you can't remove someone from access to the sheet without removing the entire group. So be sure to know how much access you want the entire group to have, or just share your sheet on an individual basis so you can customize each user's permission level to them. Another way to share a sheet with others is to publish it online so that it can be shared with people without requiring them to log into a Smartsheet account. Over here on the right, you'll find the Publish button. And then you can choose the version of the sheet you want to share. We have read-only HTML, which displays just the basic sheet without including attachments or comments. We have read-only full, which does allow reviewers to see comments and download attachments. Edit by anyone, which as you can see, allows people to edit cells, manage attachments, and make comments themselves. And there's also a calendar option that allows you to share dates from the sheet to an external calendar application. So you can choose any or all of these depending on what you want to share. I'll disable calendar and choose read only full in this case. And that pops open the options for this choice. Under access control, you can choose to allow anyone with the link to view the sheet. Be careful with this option because even if you share it with just people you trust to view the sheet, anyone who comes across that link will also be able to view the sheet. These other two options are currently grayed out because I'm using a free trial account, but if the people you're sharing with are all in your account or organization, you should select only available to users in the owner's account. And there's also the option to only make the sheet available to users who you directly share the item with. Below that is the actual link you'll share. You can copy it from here and paste it into an email or a chat application and so on. Or use the embed code to embed the sheet into a web page or a blog. At the bottom, you can choose the default view for the sheet. Maybe I want it to open in card view. And to see how this will look to people who receive the link, click Preview. And here's the sheet, which, as you can see, opened in card view. So again, just copy this link and paste it into a message to share it with others. And that's how to publish a sheet online for people to view or collaborate on without a Smartsheet account. In Smartsheet, you can share a sheet in its entirety, or just a selection of rows, to a limited number of collaborators. Anytime you or any of the people you've shared a sheet with update that sheet, you'll see those changes in real time. 
So everyone is always working with the most up-to-date version of the sheet, regardless of whether they're accessing the sheet from a Mac, Windows, iOS, or Android device. To share an entire sheet, as we've seen, just click the Share button here in the upper right-hand corner. Then enter the names of the people you want to invite to collaborate on the sheet. This can be a combination of individual people or groups if you've set up groups in your contacts. If you're sharing with a group, you'll be able to click the menu next to the group name and view the members to make sure you want to share with each person in that group. Then choose the permission level for the people you're sharing with. I'll leave this set to Editor Can Share. Everyone in the collaborators list will have the same permission level that you assign here. The exception is if any of the collaborators already has access to the sheet with a higher permission level, then they'll retain that level. Next, it's a good idea to customize the subject line and message area so everyone knows what you're sharing and why you're sharing it. Call this quarterly planning sheet, and I'll add some text here. Leave notify people checked so they'll receive the email letting them know that you've shared the sheet. You can check CC myself if you want to receive a copy of the email as well. Once you have everything filled out here, you can click Share Sheet. Everyone you added now appears here in the collaborators list. If you need to add more people, you can always enter their email in the Invite field. And then click Share Sheet again to add them to the list. Each person receiving the invitation will receive an email with a link to open the sheet in Smartsheet. If they already have a Smartsheet account, they'll be able to go directly to the sheet. If they don't have a Smartsheet account, they'll be prompted to set a password and create a free account. And again, changes to the sheet happen in real time, and if you're looking at the sheet while someone else is working on it, you'll see notifications pop up letting you know when changes have been made and who made them. You can also click the Highlight Changes button in the toolbar and enable Highlight Changes. You can choose to highlight changes that have been made in the last hour, the last day, the last three days, and so on. I'll keep last hour selected, for example, and then you can pick a color to highlight the changed cells. So now if I make a change to any of these sheets, maybe I'll reassign one of them, you can see that cell gets highlighted in real time. All right, so that's looking at sharing an entire sheet in Smartsheet. You can share a static version of your entire sheet by exporting and sending it as a PDF file. Just choose File, Send as Attachment, enter the email address of the people you want to share it with, and customize the subject and message fields as necessary. Make sure PDF is selected here by Attach As. Notice you can also send the sheet as an Excel file if you want the recipient to be able to view the data in a spreadsheet. Just be aware that it's much easier to extract or change data in an Excel file than in a PDF. You can also modify the PDF settings by clicking Options. Here I'll make sure I'm sending the entire sheet. And since I'm in the US, I'll make sure that the PDF is virtually printing to letter size paper in landscape orientation. And you can select or deselect these other options here to the right. I'll click OK. There's also the option here to schedule the delivery of the PDF for a later time or to send a version on a recurring basis which can be useful if you want to automatically send the latest version of the sheet to a team member on a regular basis. Just click Schedule and choose your delivery options. For example, I could choose Weekly and choose on which dates to send the PDF and how many times to repeat it. For now, though, I'll just leave this set to Once and make sure Send Now is checked. And to make sure you receive a copy of the PDF yourself, if you want to, check CC Me. And when you're ready, click Send. And if I go to my inbox, there's the email with the PDF attached, and I can take a look at it from here. So that's how to export your sheet as a PDF or an Excel file. So far, we've seen how to share an entire sheet or just selected rows from your sheet. If you'd like to share multiple sheets with the same group of people, you can do so by creating a workspace. I'm currently in the home area of Smartsheet. Let's come down to the Browse area, and you can see on the left I have the Sheets folder selected, where I can see all of my sheets. Let's select Workspaces. 
A workspace is an easy way to organize related sheets, reports, and dashboards in one location for easy access by you, your team, or clients. Now, because I don't have any workspaces yet, I could click Create New Workspace, or you can always come up to the Create menu up here in the upper right-hand corner and select Workspace from here. Give your workspace a name. I'll call this Q3 to Q4 Projects. I'll click OK. And there's our new workspace. Now I'll switch back to my Sheets folder. And from here, I can simply drag the sheets that I want to share into my workspace. So I'll just check these three items and I'll drag them into Q3, Q4 projects. I see a notification reminding me that any members of that workspace will be able to see these items, which is what I want in this case, so I'll click OK. And now when I select that workspace, there they are. Now I just need to invite users to the workspace. I'll click the Share button. And this workspace sharing window looks just like the sheet sharing window. The only difference is that instead of sharing a single sheet, I'm sharing access to the workspace and everything it contains. But just as before, you'll enter the names of the people you want to share with. Set their permission levels, customize the subject line and message area, and then send it off to share. Everyone you invite will have access to all the sheets and other items you've placed into the workspace, and you'll see them listed here on the panel to the right. To remove anyone from this list, click the Share button and click the X button next to their name. The nice thing about workspaces is that any new items you add to a workspace automatically inherit the permission levels you've applied, and everyone with access to the workspace will be able to see and work with the new files without you having to resend invitations each time. And if necessary, you can still share sheets in a workspace individually by right-clicking on them and choosing Share, and then inviting collaborators to that particular sheet from here. This allows you to share just that sheet with someone without giving them access to the entire workspace and its contents. So that's how to share using workspaces in Smartsheet. If you don't want to share an entire sheet with someone, but you do want to let them know about certain information contained in the sheet, you can share just selected rows with them. Select the row or rows you want to share. For example, maybe I only want to share Q4 planning and all of its contents. So I can shift click to select those rows, then click the three dot button in any one of those rows, and then choose send. Enter the recipient or recipient's email addresses. You can also add entire groups in here, then customize the subject line and message fields as needed. Check CC Me to receive a copy of the email you're sending. You also have the option to not include all columns from the rows you're sending in case some of the information in those columns isn't relevant or is sensitive. Just click Edit and uncheck any columns you don't want to send. Maybe I don't need to send the start date or due date in this case. I'll click OK, and then click Send when you're ready. Now, because I CC'd myself, I can go to my inbox, and here's what that email looks like. You can see it matches the look and format of the sheet, and it doesn't include the start and due date columns. So that's how to share rows from your sheets in Smartsheet. And there you have it. Thanks for joining me for this course on Smartsheet, and I hope you'll be able to take what you've learned here and apply it to the projects, data, and tasks you need to work with every day. For more information on working with Smartsheet, visit the Smartsheet Learning Center at help.smartsheet.com. Remember, you can always access the Help and Learning Center from your Smartsheet window by going to Help and choosing Help and Learning, where you'll be able to read about more advanced Smartsheet topics as well. And be sure to visit their community page, where you can read and participate in discussions with other Smartsheet users and ask and answer questions. But that does it for now. So until next time, I hope you'll enjoy using Smartsheet. I'm Garrick Chow, and we'll see you soon.